community, we realize that a community is only viable when all members contribute and have a voice. To embrace all classes of people, respect all cultures, races, and religions, it gives us an advantage not only in our career pursuits, but more importantly, to live productive, fruitful lives. I would be remiss if I did not use the platform to encourage you to take an active role in the mission of diversity and inclusion. As president of our university's multicultural organization, FEED, which stands for Fusing, Empowering, and Embracing Diversity, you have an open invitation to join us on this journey to actively promote a comfortable, open environment for all students. Because we are all shaped by our experiences, your presence here will ensure that the message of inclusion, mutual respect, and social justice will penetrate into classrooms, extracurricular activities, and even casual conversations, creating a more dynamic experience for the St. Francis community. At this time, Natalie Rampersad will introduce our keynote speaker. particular vision of. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Again, my name is Dr. Ron Archer, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to stand before you and share a few ideas today about what we call in our business, how to achieve peak performance under peak pressure. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said that we have come over on different ships, but that we're in the same boat now. We either learn to work together as friends or perish as fools, for a high tide can raise all of our ships. His favorite philosopher was Hegel from Germany. And Hegel said these words. He said that truth is not found in a thesis, nor is truth found in the antithesis, but that truth is found in the emergent synthesis that reconciles the two extremes. 
And what that means for us today in the 21st century, it means that none of us can be greater or smarter than all of us. The days of organizations being able to divide the community into the heads and the hands and the thinkers and the doers is coming to an end. Why? Because if my organization can collectively outthink yours, eventually I'm going to collectively whoop yours. Just a matter of time. So we want to be able to stress the difference today between casual involvement with a dream and personal commitment with a dream. You see, my friends, casual involvement and personal commitment are very similar to ham and eggs. Well, that's a strange analogy. How so? Well, with ham and eggs, the chicken was casually involved. The pig was personally committed. One who could lay and walk away, and one was there to stay. So what does it take to turn, turn a dream into reality, an idea into something that can go from orthodoxy to orthoproxy? To be able to pull victory out of the jaws of defeat and to understand that the person on top of the mountain did not fall there and that incremental improvement is better than postponed perfection. Dr. King died at 39, but look at what he accomplished in the years that he was alive. A Nobel Prize winner, a best-selling author, an agent of change, not a victim of change, a man that led with love and veracity, who understood the power of pedantic nomenclature, intellectual academic jargon, combined with the power of love and forgiveness, and to create a movement that was so great, people said, who cares if the horse is blind? Load the wagon, we can make it. Let's get in the rowboat, let's chase Shamu, and bring the tartar sauce with you. We're gonna have lunch today. He was indeed an agent of change. But the key issue today, and how we build communities, Dr. King would always talk about, was how well do we listen? How well do we listen to one another, to our colleagues and friends, to our parents? That separates the winners from the whiners, the climbers from the quitters, and the contenders from the pretenders is the capability to listen adroitly. So I'm going to give you a test. I get my NFL clients. I work with the Pittsburgh Steelers and with their staff and players, the Cleveland Browns, need a lot of help in all their work and various teams that need to learn how to become what are called agents of change. If you will, please either take out your tablet or your phone or a piece of paper, whatever you got to work with, and number that particular item from one to seven vertically. So either a tablet or your cell phone or something to write with and write on. I want to be able to test your listening acumen. How adroitly, how clearly, how succinctly do you listen to separate fact from fiction and myth from reality? It is the most important quality today in being able to become an agent of change and becoming successful in business or life. How well can you find the opportunities in the crisis, the solution in the quagmire, the challenges in the opportunity? So, one to seven vertically. I'm going to ask you a series of questions. I'm going to ask them only once. So please listen as carefully as you possibly can and either type or write what you think is the correct answer. Number seven after the one through six will not be a question. It is going to be an old cliche that I'm going to dress up in pedantic nomenclature and intellectual academic jargon try to confuse you, but being dynamic paradigm pioneers, you'll know exactly what I'm saying and you write it down with great acumen and great clarity. So let's begin, please. Number one. A man built an ordinary house with four sides. Each side has a southern exposure. A bear comes to the door and rings the doorbell. What color is the bear and why is the bear that color? You have three seconds. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. How well do you listen? Number two, you're in a dark, damp cave with only one match. You have a kerosene lamp, an oil lantern, and a wood-burning stove. Which do you like first to achieve maximum heat? Number two, write something down. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. Number three, how many animals of each species did Moses take aboard the ark before the great flood? Pretty simple question, pretty simple answer. Number three, three seconds. 1,001, 1,002, 
1003. Number four, is there any federal law against a man marrying his widow's sister? Number four, how well do you listen? The most important quality in leadership in the 21st century. Number five, an archaeologist claims that she's dug up a coin that is clearly dated 46 BC. Why is this person not telling the truth? Number five, how well do you listen? To separate fact from fiction and myth from reality. Number six, it is Independence Day in the United States. People having barbecues at the beaches, fireworks going off in the air. And the question arises, is there a 4th of July over in England? Pretty simple question, pretty simple answer. Number six. And last but not least is number seven. What is it's not going to be a question here, but again, a simple saying. An old familiar Ideal, but I'm going to dress up in academic jargon, but being great listeners, you'll figure out the imagery and write down or type in what you believe is the correct old saying in the vernacular of this particular dispensation. Number seven, a feathered vertebrae enclosed in the grasping organ has an estimated worth that is higher than dual encapsulated in the branch shrub. I will say it again once more. A feathered vertebrae enclosed in the grasping organ has an estimated worth that is higher than dual encapsulated in the branched shrub. What is that old saying you've heard a thousand times before, but just has been dressed up in pedantic language to try to confuse your cerebellum and your reticular activating system? All right, look at your papers or your tablets or your phones again. Look for accuracy and quality and absolute lucid understanding of these principles. And if you will please, because we're such a family here, and we're such a community of thought, would you please exchange your, your, your phones or papers or have with a neighbor so we can see how you did. Call the old honor system. Faces. How you doing? You alright? What color is the bear? I didn't write it down. Well, well, well. Let's see how well we well, well, did. Number one, a man built an ordinary house with four sides. Each side has a sudden exposure, a bear comes through the door and rings the doorbell. What color is the bear and why is the bear that color? The answer is? White. The answer is white. Why is the answer white? You're the, every side facing south, the only place where that's possible is North Pole, deductive listening, polar bear, white, kiss yourself. It's okay, it's good. Number one, white. Very good. Number two, what do you like first in the dark, damp cave to achieve maximum heat? You like the? The match. Nothing else can be lit until you like the match. Little things count in relationships, in success, or in failure. How many animals aboard this ark before the great flood? How many? The answer is zero. I said, how many did Moses take aboard the ark? It wasn't Moses. You know the story. It was Noah, of course. <laughs> we call that the power of infancy. We hear what we want to hear. Number four, is there any federal law against a man marrying his widow's sister? Why? He's dead. If he has a widow, he can't do anything too much, at least not in this dimensional plane of life. So there's no federal law against doing that. Number five, an archaeologist claims she's dug up a coin that is played dated 46 BC. Why is this person not putting the truth? Coin. Because they didn't know they were in BC to call things BC in BC because BC means what? Before. They didn't know they were in before Christ to call it before Christ. We didn't call things BC to sometime in AD. So it wasn't even possible at that time. Is there a 4th of July over in England? Yes. Yes, on the calendar. First, second, third, fourth. They don't have the barbecue, but they have the date. July 4th exists on the calendar. Yes, they have it. They don't celebrate like we do in America, but they have the date. And last but not least, a feathered vertebrae enclosed 
and the grasping organ has an estimated worth that is higher two than dual in encapsulated no. into the branch. Two Romeo birds in hand. Is, two birds in a hand. bird in the bird hand, in hand is worth more than two in the bush. Get your answers back, please. I Let's see that. how well we did. Two birds in hand. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give some prizes away. How many got all seven correct? Would you please stand? Anybody with seven? Anybody with seven? Lucky number seven. Seven in heaven. Anybody with seven? Okay, that happens sometimes. How many got just six right? Six, would you please stand? Anybody with six? One, we have one back here. Stand up, stand up, let's see your greatness. Give her a hand. Woo! And we have them over here, very good. I got some, uh, uh, we did NFL coaching clinics on leadership and wealth creation. We'll make sure to give you uh, some DVDs on that before you leave today uh -huh. for you to have. And that will help you a great deal. How many got five right? Raise your hand. Five? I'm going to give you what's called the National Football League a Wimbledon. And how many will never tell? Future Senator Thomas. Very good. Outstanding. Very good. Very good. Very good. All right. Now, beyond listening, the other key issue is being able to get out of your comfort zone, and we call it TTP, meaning you've got to talk to people. The reason Hold that this. wealth is created in the 21st century Hold this. is when you take opposite Hold ideals, oh, you paradoxical oh, didactic DNA opposite tired. concepts, and blend them so together yeah. allows you to have an explosive reality. Most partnerships with Microsoft or Apple Computer, you have people that think differently, look differently, but they're able to blend the opposites to create new wealth in the 21st century. But you got to talk to people. You got to get beyond your comfort zone. You have to avoid what is called the vulnerability of sameness that happened to the Irish in the potato famine. They bred out of all the differences in their potatoes to get the best yield to feed their family, which was fine. Sameness is great when all the conditions remain the same. But when the conditions change, what was your greatest strength? become your greatest weakness. When the potato blight hit and nothing would grow, the potatoes were now poisonous. 1.5 million starved to death and 2.5 million left in the great Irish diaspora to go to America and to England. The vulnerability of sameness. Because what can kill one can then kill all. It is in the power of collaborative diversity that new ideas and new wealth and new breakthrough thinking becomes established. But it takes all of us to get out of our comfort zones and understand that reality and not be in what is called the dispensation of sameness. We're never called to be the same. We're called to be one but uniquely different with a blending to create a harmonious understanding of new ideas and new technology. The very person that gets on your nerve is the very person that's the key to your breakthrough and finding new technology and new understanding of wealth in the 21st century. So what I want you to do again is take out your tablets or your phone, our last test of the day, to test how well you think outside of your proverbial paradigm box and your dispensation of sameness. I want you to give a heading to the following idea. The heading is this, a person who and a colon. That's it, a person who and a colon. I'm gonna give you some descriptions. I don't want you to write down anybody's name or answers or parenthetical concepts. Just write down what I tell you in that particular heading. For example, number one, a person who has never had a dog as a pet. Just write down, never had a dog. A person who has never had a dog as a pet, number one. Number two, a person who has a cat. Somebody that has a cat as a pet. That's number two. 
Never had a dog, number one, and a person who has a cat. Number three, a person who was raised on a farm. A person who was raised on a farm. So, never had a dog as a pet, number one, person who has a cat, number two, and a person that was raised on a farm. Number four, someone who has been skydiving. Someone that has been skydiving out of a plane in a parachute and floating safely down to Aeroforma. That's number four. Never had a dog, has a cat, raised on a farm, been skydiving. Number five, someone that has gone white water rafting and lived to talk about it. White water rafting as an experience. That's number five. You a person who never had a dog, has a cat, raised on a farm, been skydiving, white water rafting. Number six, a person that was raised in Trinidad. A person that was raised, grew up in a beautiful island nation called Trinidad. Number seven, someone that has Native American heritage in their ethnicity. Someone that has Native American heritage in their ethnicity. Number eight, someone who has visited the Vatican in Rome, the Holy See, visited the Vatican. And had a chance to come up that beautiful dome and go up to the top of the basilica and climb the rope and peek it out and see the seven hills of Rome. Very beautiful. Number nine, someone that plays the piano. Someone that can play the piano. Has the gift of playing piano playing. Number 10, someone who cross stitches as a hobby. Someone that can cross stitch as a hobby. Has that particular skill set. Cross stitches, that's number 10. Number 11, person that is the Firstborn in their family, in the sibling, sibling ranking, ranking, somebody that's the firstborn among your siblings. Ghost. Ghost. Almost done. Next, a person who shares the same birth month as yourself. A person who shares the same birth month as yourself. Next, a person who sings in a choir, has a melodious voice that is projected in a choir of voices. A person that sings in a choir. A few more were done. A person that owns a longer burger basket. It's like it sounds, longer burger. Somebody that owns a longer, if you have one, you know what it is. A longer burger basket. Next, a person that has visited Maui, Hawaii. Maui, Hawaii. And the great island state of Hawaii. Hawaii name. Three more were done. A person that is certified as a scuba diver. Certified scuba diver. Two more, a person that has gone on an African safari. An African safari. And last but not least, a person who is the baby of the family. The last born, the baby of the family. All righty, you have your list in front of you. We call this TTP, the ability to talk to people. And if that doesn't work, TTNP, talk to more people. We have more prizes to give out, but this is the assignment. What you must do is talk to people in this room and find out who matches that particular description. But here's the catch. Once somebody agrees to get on your list, 
They cannot get on your list only for one item. They can't be there for two or three or four. And the person that gets it done first, the first five, will win some prizes from the Dunamis Institute. The first step, please, everybody stand up. Stand up. Stand for something or fall for anything. Talk to people and get your thing done. Talk to people. To people and get your thing done. What's up, man? Uh, last born. Your last born. Last born. Yeah, what? baby. Taylor. The baby. I'm a baby. I'm the baby. Yeah. It's a little weird. Um. Oh yes, yeah, so he said only one item. Uh, yeah. Then I asked you. Oh, no, I'm, I didn't write anything. Oh, uh, my bad. Nicole, you have a doll. Come on, hi. All right. Uh, last born. Anybody need a last born? Are you last born? Yeah. Oh, Are you last born? Exactly. <laughs> Taylor. Baby of the family, yeah, the, the last thing. person. Uh, <laughs> Taylor. Are you smiling? Or a pretender, but a storm, a significant trauma, overwhelming, reasonable mind will never leave you like it found you. The greatest movie that gives us the understanding of the effect of a storm is The Wizard of Oz. The star of that movie is not Dorothy, it's not the Tin Man, it's not even the wizard. The star of the movie is the storm. Because everybody's life was changed by the storm. Everybody had been impacted by the storm. Everybody had been turned upside down by the storm. Dorothy lost her way. Her house picked up, thrown somewhere, landed in St. Francis University, away from family and friends and Pookie and them. Don't know where you are. Where's Pookie? <laughs> She even said to a dog, this is not Kansas, Toto. We call it being OD, out there. <laughs> Where are you? Out there. Mm -hmm. I don't know nobody. Nobody looks like me, talks like me, eats like me, dances like me. Nobody's like me. <laughs> Dorothy lost her way. The Tin Man storm was so horrific, he lost his he told Dorothy, I don't have a brain. I've been so traumatized, beat down. I've been so rejected. I have failed so many times. I thought I passed the test. I didn't. I cleared a major. I can't finish it. I'm having financial problems. I've lost my mind. The scarecrow said, I can't think anymore. I feel like a blind man in a dark room chasing black cats. So simply, I'm not there. I've lost my mind. Cool for Cocoa Puffs. Cool for Cocoa Puffs. The Tin Man had an ability and a talent. Why? He held an axe in his hand, but because of his storm, he was traumatized. He could not move. Why? The pain of the past and the fear of the future kept him stuck in the present. He couldn't move. He was traumatized. He was stagnant. He was in a rut. He couldn't swing the axe. He lost his heart. He lost his first love. He lost his passion. He lost his tenacity and veracity for life. He lost his will. He was stuck. And if it wasn't for Dorothy, if it wasn't for the scarecrow coming by and offering him what has been through antiquity through time, some oil, which means love and empathy, he began to move again. He couldn't do it by himself. But people who were different from him, this girl from Kansas, this brain dead scarecrow, gave me what I needed. And then of course the king of the jungle lost his swag. <laughs> Scared of his own shadow trying to fake it till he could make it. He lost his mojo, his swag was gone. 
You come here, you think you're somebody in high school, you did all that, and now you come to a new place, you get knocked down by challenges. Your storm hits you. Don't like the roommate, don't like the food, something went wrong, bad professor, nobody, cats and dogs, marry. You lose your swag. What they could not do individually, when they got together, they could do collectively. They went and saw the wizard, and they demanded what was rightfully theirs already. How have you survived your storms? Because here's the fact of life, my friends. A storm is either right with you now, just leaving, or on its way. Storms are inevitable. You can't avoid them. You can't sneak away from them. You can't hide from them. They're going to find you. And your ability to be able to adjust, adapt, and overcome, how do you do it? What's the secret? You have got to face it head on. There is two laws in nature that are very powerful. The law of gravity. It keeps you tied to the ground. It keeps you stuck. It keeps you on terra foil. But then there's a greater law called the law of aerodynamics where a five-ton plane can actually get off the ground. Why? Because it goes right into the storm. A plane must face its wind in order to rise above it. How do you deal with your storms? See, I've learned something in 25 years of, of working with presidents and prime ministers and football players. Everybody in this room is a teabag. Everybody here, you don't know how strong you are that you put in some hot water. And what's on the inside of you is going to come out and change everything around you. When a tea bag is put in hot water, what happens? The water changes the color, the viscosity, the taste, the smell. The entire environment is transformed by what's inside. What's inside? Life is going to find out. Life is going to challenge you and test you. And life will ask you a question. If you're trying to get to your dream, trying to get to your purpose and passion in life, life will ask you a question. Are you real gold or are you fool's gold? Pressure cooks the ham. We find out. You see, when a metallurgist wants to find gold, they have got to dig out of the ground 525,000 pounds of useless rock to find one ounce of gold. I'll say it again, 525,000 pounds of useless rock to find one ounce of gold. But when you find gold, it's never by itself. It's always intertwined with other things, mud and trees and, and all kind of carbon and other metals. And so the metallurgist has to take that slag and put it in a furnace. It's called refining. What happens? All the non-metals are separated out by the heat. And what's left is a slag of metals that are convoluted, nickel and iron and Tin and gold and fool's gold. They turn the fire up and all the metal separate. What's left is gold and fool's gold. Real gold and fool's gold look alike. They feel it. They shine alike. But what's the difference? The imposter is exposed when the flame is turned up and through the nose test they find out who's real Who's fake? You see, real gold is inert, which means it reacts with nothing. It doesn't corrode, it doesn't rust. It does not smell when you put it under the flame. It's inert. Gold, when burned, smells like air. But fool's gold, aha, gives up its true identity as sulfur pyrite which is a kind of iron. And under fire, it smells like rotten eggs. It stinks to high heaven. And the question becomes, in your storm, under your flame, through your adversity, do you smell like real gold or do you smell like rotten eggs? 
What comes out of your mouth under adversity? Who do you blame? Who are you still mad at? Who haven't you forgiven? Who are you still pointing a finger at? Mama, daddy, cousin, uncle, pookie. <laughs> Who are you still angry with? Who do you still blame? What comes out of your mouth when you don't get your way? How do you handle your storm? You see, some people in hot water become like an egg. An egg gets hard, unforgiving. A potato starts off hard, but in the boiling water, it becomes soft and malleable. What made Dr. King amazing? What made this man a legend? What made this man an agent of change and not a victim of change? He went through so many storms and he came out better and not bitter. He learned to love and forgive. He learned to become a storm survivor. So Dr. Archer, author of five books, presidential advisor, tell me, man, What's the secret to surviving the storm? Developing four Qs, IQ, TQ, RQ, and CQ. Information quotient, talent quotient, character quotient, and resiliency quotient. Your head, your heart, your hands, and your habits impact your humanity, which changes your habitat. I'll say it one more again. Your information quotient, meaning that you never stop learning. You have an insatiable, unquenchable thirst to learn, not just from the books you read and the professors you listen to, but from everybody around you. You can learn from a homeless man. You can learn from somebody who's been a drug. You have the capacity and the veracity to look for different kinds of people who you know can teach you something about you. You're always looking to increase your information quotient, your head. Second is your heart. That is called your resiliency quotient. You understand that failure is not final. It's not the falling down, it's the staying down. When life knocks you down, you land on your back because if you can look up, then you can get up so you never give up because you are resilient. Do you quit when it gets hard? Do you stay down in your misery? Or do you turn your pain into power, your wounds into wisdom, your scars into stars, and your stumbling blocks into stepping stones, and your tragedy into triumphs, and your failures into fortune? Look at two people that understood the power of resiliency. A man was 65 years old, bankrupt with no teeth. Rough place to be in life. 65, bankrupt, no teeth. He didn't complain and woe is me and pity party. He began to cook chicken at truck stops and truckers loved his chicken. They began to celebrate him and sell him all over the country. And this man made money selling chicken to truckers. And somebody said, man, you should start a business. He went to the banker and the bank said, you are six to five with no teeth and can't even chew your own chicken. How do you know it's good? He said, I need some money. True story, he was told 1,099 times, you're too old and too broke and got no teeth as no. His name was Colonel Sanders. <laughs> 1,099 times, he wouldn't give up. He had this ability to push through. Before you hear me today, people, before you ever have a breakthrough, it's going to feel like a breakdown. But you've got to be persistent. How about Stephen Jobs? Founded this great company that you are holding right now. All his creative genius. The company that he founded fired him. Apple Computer said, see ya, don't wanna be ya. Can you imagine how it would feel to found a company in your garage, build it into something, and the board of directors tell you you're too radical, you've got to go and show him. What would you do? Who would you blame? Would you lose your mind? Would you blame everybody? Instead, he got creative and he took his, his stock earnings and he bought a company called Pixar. 
a little struggling animated computerized company that wasn't going anywhere until he got involved with it, put his money and his idea and his genius and created this little movie that changed the entire movie industry called Toy Story, where the entire movie was made through computer animation and changed Hollywood. He turned his pain into power. He turned his fame into fortune. But that wasn't enough. He said, I got enough money now. I'm coming back. Apple was selling at $6 a share. At its height, $425 a share. Do the math. He came back. He said, okay, I've changed the computer industry. I've changed the movie industry. How about we change the phone industry? Something called the iPhone. Make the phone personal. Make it tactile. Make it really relational. He turned something that was stiff and stoic into your friend. Then he said, how about something that will be bigger than a phone and yet productive? Do something called the what? The iPad. The fastest selling technological device in the world. Selling 10,000 a minute when it came out. He changed the computer industry. He changed the phone industry. He changed the movie industry. He changed the technological industry. And pretty soon, they're going to change the watch industry. How do you survive your storm? That's called resiliency. Failure is never final. IQ, RQ, TQ, what's your talent? There's only three talents in the world. Either it's interpersonal, technological, or administrative. What's your skill? Find it, get it when you fit in, and grow it. People will pay you to master what you do best. What's your calling? What's your gift? What's your passion? And lastly, CQ, your character quotient. You see, you can't fake it till you make it, because character will show up in the end. Who you are, the team bag will come out of the hot water. Who are you under pressure defines who you are. Character means what? I deliver on promises made. I give you my word, it's my bond. I do what is right, not what's popular. Dr. King was leading the revolution in America. His own people said, go home, Dr. Martin Luther King. You're a coward letting people slap and spit on you. You're a coward letting people beat on you. And as you serve them, people turn their backs, but he still loved them. How's your IQ? How's your TQ? How's your RQ? How's your CQ? Head, heart, hands, habits, affects your humanity, and changes your habitat. But Dr. Archer, yeah, it's easy for you. You make your first million dollars when you were 28 years old. You bought stock. You built companies. Okay, but how do you know about my struggles, man? I come from a middle class family, a working class family. How do you understand me? When I was 10 years, I closed. As I was 10 years old, I put a gun to my head to blow my brains out. I took my mother's 32 snub nosed revolver, put it to my temple, and tried to pull the trigger and blast my brains all over her wall. You must ask the question, why would a 10-year-old child want to die? Tim is, as Tim is a child, to dream being Superman, Batman, the Hulk, being a police officer, whatever you want to be, I wanted to die. The gun had a safety, I couldn't use it, but I wanted to kill myself. Because to me, life was worse than death at 10. My family comes from immigration. My grandmother is German. My grandfather is a black Cuban. They both met and married. My grandmother was tall, thin, blonde, and blue-eyed. She was so tall and skinny and white, we called her French fry. My grandfather was black, purple black, beautiful black man from Cuba. He was so black and beautiful, we called him hamburger. And hamburger met French fry and made a happy meal. <laughs> we had seven McNuggets with special sauce, seven mulatto beautiful children. They bought a home called a place called Buckeye. The American dream is coming alive for these two immigrants. My grandfather had a floor. I like to drink overproof Cuban rum. And one day he was out with his white wife, and a man that was drunk saw them together and said to my grandfather in the 1940s, he said to my grandfather, to my grandmother, why would you be a nigger lover? Why would you love this black tar baby? 
my grandfather's arms big as my thighs working the sugar cane fields. He broke the man's neck with one punch, went to the worst prison in Ohio called Mansfield Performatory. Locked down 23 hours a day. My grandmother being German didn't complain. She got cancer of the eye, take out half of her face. She was getting metastasized to her brain. She couldn't work, she was sick. They lost their house, lost their car, became like homeless street urchins going from place to place. And in the end, my mom became a prostitute at 14, selling her body in order to buy food at 14. She got pregnant at 16. The pimp tried to kill the baby, threw it downstairs, made her drink, stabbed the baby with hangers and all kinds of things to kill this. It's called a trick baby. Who wants a trick baby? You're turning a trick and you get a baby. The kid was born premature with holes and no pancreas and learning disabilities and wet the bed and couldn't talk and all the rest. That baby was me. I am a trick baby, ashamed of when I was young, of my life and who I was. My mother was so ashamed of me, how I was conceived. She would take a picture with me when I grew up with her. And then she had this crazy woman who was her madam named Dolores, who was a sadistic woman who hated men. And whenever she would babysit me, she would take a broomstick and rape me with it anally. And when you are sexually abused with a broomstick or any other kind of way, there are four rules in life. Don't talk, don't trust, don't feel, and pretend nothing is going on. Oh, I've been there, baby. And going to school, smelling like pee. And I stuttered so bad, my friends had a poem about me. His name is Renardo. He is a retardo. He sits on the steeple. When he talks duck, he spits at the people. By 10, it was time to check out here. I wanted to die. I understand your storm. I understand the secret that you carry. I understand what it means to be ashamed of your story. I understand how doubts and low self-esteem and don't know if you're going to make it. I understand what it feels like to think you might not make it through this thing. But I'm alive for one reason, to let you know, yes, I was born a trick baby, but the trick was on the devil. Because God said what was meant for evil, God would use for good. That everything you've gone through in your life is a down payment on your destiny. It was a fourth grade teacher named Mrs. Spears who became my tutor in stuttering and let me read the Bible. My family was all atheistic. No faith, no Bible, no church. I knew about church as chicken, but no church. My family hated church. And this teacher, this white old lady, began to have me read scripture that said of God before you, who can be against you? Things that seem impossible with men are possible with God. I know the plans I have for you. And maybe work in an old state recording of goodwill saying things like the sea ceaseth and it suffices thus a proper preparation prevents poor performance impossible. Punitive punishment at dawn, the dawn went down and our, our oars are over and over and over and over. And she taught me something. She said, anything worth doing in life is worth doing poorly at first until you master it. The person on top the mountain did not climb there. Yeah, I came from the sewer. I came from shame. I came from failure. But it doesn't mean you got to stay there. Get your IQ and TQ and RQ and CQ right. And understand that if you work hard, keep your nose clean, and come back up from the depths of hell, there are people willing to help you if you talk to them and tell them who you are, where you come from, and keep yourself alive. Understand, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Dr. King told us to dream. Today, my entire family is a Christian family. My mom, found my dad, my grandparents, my sister, had three uncles hooked on heroin. Now we have a halfway house for drug addicts. And we have churches and schools and clinics in Africa, in Germany, in the Bahamas, in Florida, because we learned one thing. Pain makes you better or bitter. But here's the key. We all have a choice. The one thing you control every single day of your 
is your attitude. Your attitude determines your altitude. Is your nose up or is your nose down? When you go through life, you're going to face turbulence. Everybody does. But if you keep your nose up, you can rise above whatever you've been through and understand there's somebody else who's worse off than you and you are here to serve. Dr. King understood that. He was alive to serve other people. The last thing I beg you to do is this. Mentor somebody. In my research, I've learned one thing. That's what happened to me. I want to tell you one last thing as I leave you from St. Francis, go back to Bahamas. You may never see me again in life, but I'm going to tell you the key to it all. The kingdom of God is at hand when you reach out and you love somebody. When you reach out and you tutor somebody and you reach out and you forgive somebody. The kingdom of God is in your hand to love teach. If you can mentor somebody an hour a week, that's it, one hour a week for a year, you will change the IQ, TQ, RQ, and CQ. I'm not talking about that nomenclature or theoretical physics. It happened to me and I've done it hundreds of thousands of times all over this world. The way to get over your pain is by sharing with somebody else who's worse off than you. And you get blessed and you grow. An attitude of service. Mentor somebody. Go back home and help somebody. Go to a cancer ward and read a story to a child who's dying of leukemia. Go to an elderly place where the people there cry themselves to sleep at night because nobody will come to see them. It don't take much. I promise you, if you do this, you'll be blessed in ways you can't even understand. And God will answer your prayers. Don't look for the miracle. Be the miracle. My name is Dr. Ronaldo I. Archer. Born a trick baby. Great, left to die. Suicidal. Today, Advisor of the three U.S. presidents, author of five best selling books, a husband, a father, a pastor, a bishop, but just one. Alive to tell you your better days are ahead if you just don't quit. Dream big and never settle. Mediocrity. May God richly bless you. This Martin Luther King Day. Take care. God bless. Bless you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, feel free. There's a microphone right here. I'm more than happy to take a few minutes to answer those that have to leave. You may leave. I do have more DVDs for those that like to get some. Um, they're not very expensive. They're five bucks.